Uh, Mr. Tanner, uh, Mr. Smith, Mr. Carlton, members of the Accountability Roundtable, uh, distinguished guests and law school colleagues and friends. Uh, my name is Cheryl Saunders, for those of you who I haven't met. Uh, I'm Associate Dean here of the Master's Program and a member of the Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all here to this important lecture on the theme of integrity in politics. And in doing so, I acknowledge the Wurundjeri people as the traditional owners of the land on which this event is held and pay respect to their elders and their families. This lecture is held under the auspices of the Accountability Roundtable in conjunction with the Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies. The Roundtable is a non-partisan group of citizens concerned about the erosion of honesty and integrity in parliamentary and governmental processes. Under the leadership of Tim Smith, the President, who's here on my right, and Jim Carlton, who's quietly sitting in the second row there, um, the Roundtable approached the Centre several years ago to ask us to consider host, co-hosting an annual public lecture. Our interests are a very good fit and we readily agreed. And it's a great pleasure to cooperate with the round table in this important exercise. It's also a great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker whose interests and credentials are an equally perfect fit. Lindsay Tanner was until recently the federal member for Melbourne in the Commonwealth Parliament and therefore our local member here. From 2007 to 2010, he was Minister for Finance and Deregulation uh, in the Commonwealth Government. He's presently Special Advisor to Lazard Australia and Vice Chancellor's Fellow at Victoria University. Lindsay Tanner is also an alumnus of this law school of whom we are extremely proud. I still remember him as a student in my eight o'clock constitutional and administrative law class who asked only occasional but always very pertinent questions. It's good to have him back in the law school, and I hope that this will be only one of many visits. Since Lindsay's retirement from active politics, I think, uh, he has written several influential books, Sideshow, Dumbing Down Democracy, and Politics with Purpose. The full title of his lecture this evening is, most appropriately, Integrity in Politics, The Power of Ideas. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Cheryl. It's great to be back at the Melbourne Uni Law School. Amazingly enough to see some of the people who were responsible for training me in the law, uh, particularly Cheryl, of course, who, as she mentioned, did have the dubious distinction of lecturing me uh, in one or two subjects. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, I also acted as a bit of a minor research assistant uh, to Cheryl in one particular project for a period, and also Michael Cromlin, who I also served uh, in a minor capacity offline. Uh, I can't, I, I'm not sure whether Michael actually lectured me, but uh, it's great to be back and to be here with old friends. Uh, the law school's changed a bit since that time. Uh, so have I, of course. <laughs> it looks better, I don't, but nonetheless, I'm uh, really pleased to be here and to have the opportunity to address what I see as really crucial issues in the current iteration of national affairs in Australia. Over the past two years, as Cheryl alluded to, I've contributed to public debate on several themes, things like media trivialisation of politics, the Labor Party's loss of wider purpose, the digital revolution, the causes of the global financial crisis. Tonight, I want to draw on all of these threads and try to bring them together into a single narrative. Now, it won't quite be a universal theory of everything, however hard that I try, but I do want to try and explain the big structural shifts that have been rippling through Australian politics and society and to connect them with the theme of the lecture, with the question about the integrity of our politics, and in particular what I would describe as the intellectual integrity of our politics. Tom Uren famously remarked that everything is connected to everything else. And what I seek to do tonight is to connect the forces that are involved in the decline in intellectual integrity into our politics uh, 
into a wider context, to a wider picture of structural change in not only our society but also Western society generally. Because although these factors are unique in their configuration in each individual country, they are very, very similar across the developed world. In early 2010, my then media advisor and good friend Nadia Daskew was asked by a Fairfax journalist if she had any good gossip for a good weekend profile on Barnaby Joyce, who at that point was Shadow Finance Minister. I had five Shadow Finance Ministers in my less than three years as Finance Minister. I think this is something of an Australian record. If anybody's aware of anybody who can claim something better, please let me know. And Barnaby Joyce was one of those five Shadow Finance Ministers. Uh, he served only a relatively brief period. I'll leave it up to your imagination as to why. <laughs> And the journalist asked Nadia, have you got any good gossip about Barnaby for this profile? And Nadia, being the ever loyal staff member she was, responded by saying, why don't you do a profile of Lindsay? And the journalist responded, Lindsay's too normal. <laughs> now, I wasn't sure when I heard about this sometime later whether to be mortified, insulted, pleased, relieved. I was all a bit confused and conflicted about it. But subsequently I did reflect on this and concluded that these three words really tell you just about everything you need to know about contemporary Australian politics. My deepest suspicions were confirmed. I was now working in the entertainment industry. I hadn't signed up to work in the entertainment industry, but somehow that's where I'd ended up. Now, there's always been obviously a substantial element of theatre in politics. And up to a point it can be very useful in helping to explain and make accessible what are often very complex issues and processes. The tragedy for Australia is that that theatrical dimension has now more or less completely taken over our politics. It now determines the content of our public discourse and it corrodes the essence of democratic government. Our mass media, as I'm sure you will have noticed, portray politics largely as a sporting contest dominated by outsized personalities and simplistic morality tales. The kind of good guys and bad guys, Punch and Judy, cowboys and Indians, whatever metaphor you would like to use. In order to do this, the content of issues is routinely grotesquely distorted in order to make them entertaining and titillating and captivating for an audience that, by and large, on average, is largely uninterested and distracted. Therefore, Irrelevant trivia becomes national news. And the serious processes of government, the stuff that actually influences people's lives and prospects and circumstances, occurs more and more beyond the public gaze. Now, politicians, of course, are complicit in this process and have responded to it, in some cases, with great enthusiasm. The growing entertainment imperative has drawn the political class into this kind of vicious circle with our media. Much of our national leader's time and effort is now dedicated to generating attention-grabbing images for the visual media. So think about this. Whenever you see one of our leading politicians on a building site, in a childcare centre, at a school, or in speedos on the beach, maybe, whenever you see any of those, ask yourself, how much time and effort on the part of that political leader and various staff members has gone into creating that image that could be on your TV screen for 20 seconds or five seconds? The answer, of course, is substantial. Substantial. More and more, that is what is attracting the time and energy and effort of our political leaders. And by definition, while they are doing those things, they are not casting their attention to the big issues, the serious challenges facing Australia. More and more, the theatre is absorbing the energies of the politicians. Now, one of the minor pursuits that I've been engaged in since I left politics is to create a set of what I call Tanner's Laws of Politics. No doubt you will have all heard of Newton's Laws of Physics. Well, this is my attempt to create a political equivalent. Some of you may have heard me in other forums talk about these, and it's still a work in progress. Uh, 
We do not yet have a Nobel Prize for politics, but once one eventuates, I'm hoping to be the inaugural winner. Any of you who know any members of the Nobel Committee, please take note. Anyway, I want to mention some of my laws of politics tonight to illustrate in a slightly cheeky way just how dominant the influence of this, this paradigm has become. And I'll just rattle through them quickly. First, in politics, everyone exaggerates everything all of the time. Second, no one ever complained about consultation when they liked the outcome. Third, the more removed or more distant you are from power and responsibility, the more left-wing you become. There are one or two former prime ministers who are perfect illustrations, living illustrations of this principle. I now find myself in the astonishing position of, on quite a range of issues, being more right-wing than Malcolm Fraser. And at the time that Cheryl was lecturing me, you would have uh, raised an eyebrow at the possibility that that was going to occur. I don't necessarily kind of concede that there's anything wrong with this. I think that Malcolm's sort of got interesting. Uh, next, when organisations and lobby groups seek to persuade politicians to adopt a particular policy or point of view or project and support their position, if they think they have public opinion on their side, they talk about democracy. If they don't, they talk about leadership. Most politicians understand that that word leadership is in fact code for commit political suicide. That is why most of the time you don't see a great deal of leadership. Next, when you see opinion polls that say that two thirds of Australians would happily pay higher taxes for better government services, what you're actually seeing is a poll that reflects some people who genuinely believe that, but a much larger group who are saying some other bastard should pay higher taxes so I can get better government services. And finally, for all politicians, and this is where the media dynamic is pretty crucial, for all politicians, all shock jocks, editors, proprietors in particular, journalists, producers, are all unbelievably witty, intelligent, good-looking, noble, and should be reminded of this on a daily basis. And believe me, they are. They are. If ever you want to see Olympic flattery, watch your politicians when they network amongst some of those people. It is astonishing to see. Now, there is, of course, a more insidious aspect to all of this. Our political leaders have become ever more skillful at the creation and manipulation of misleading imagery. Now, there's always been a certain degree of misleading in politics, I would concede that. But it has reached new heights. Our national politics has become an endless parade of meaningless announcements and personal narratives. And politicians are collaborating with media to produce content that is essentially entertaining, at least up to a point, but is inherently non-informative. Some of it, of course, is harmless but much of this content actively misinforms and misleads. Australian politics now really revolves around two core operating principles, and for any aspiring politician in the audience, sadly, I have to say to you, if you follow these principles, you'll probably do well. These principles are these. Look like you're doing something, and don't offend anyone who matters. The emphasis in the first is look like you're doing something. Actually doing something can be quite dangerous. So it's generating the appearance of doing something, preferably while not doing very much at all. And secondly, avoid offending or upsetting any significant constituency that may be politically important. And if you look back over the past decade or so at the endless stream of announcements of reviews, inquiries, targets, offices, committees, issue ambassadors, one of my favourites, feasibility studies, summits, forums, you'll see what I mean. Underneath all of these mostly meaningless announcements, which are essentially designed to get media coverage and nothing else, lies those two principles. Announcing a pointless process and pretending that it is substantive content is now almost universal. I want to cite, in a bipartisan way, a couple of illustrations. In mid-2007, the Labor opposition announced that it would establish a business advisory group headed by Sir Rod Eddington to provide direct advice to a Labor government. We got very good media coverage, front page of The Australian indeed. 
The purpose was to demonstrate that Labor was serious about helping business and that business could work with Labor. And it achieved that purpose. Unfortunately, though, this advisory group never eventuated. It only ever had one member, that was Sir Rod Eddington. It never was constituted. And in spite of occasional casual inquiries from journalists after we formed government, no media outlet ever exposed the fact that this big ballyhooed announcement had actually been stillborn, that nothing had ever happened. Recently, Tony Abbott made a major speech on productivity. Now, in order to justify media coverage, it had to have a kind of action point. You know, a, you can have lots of ranting and raving and analysis and criticism of the government, but in that speech, you have to actually say, and therefore, we will do X if we're in government, or en route to government. His key action point was to announce, courtesy of the standard formula I've just described, a backbench committee to consider productivity reform ideas. Now, of course, serious propositions to improve productivity are almost invariably controversial, difficult, things that are going to be very, very politically tough. So Tony Abbott defaulted to this formula, which is to announce a process and pretend that it's content. The announcement got pretty reasonable media coverage. It is a fair bet that few journalists will take any further interest in this committee and it's a fair bet that nothing substantive will ever emerge from it. In fact, if past indications are any guide, it is a distinct possibility that it will never meet because it's already completed its work. Its real purpose was to create media coverage, not generate productivity reform ideas. And of course, it's achieved that purpose and everybody can move on. So these are just two illustrations of how that dynamic works. These kind of announcements allow a political leader to convey an impression of action while avoiding anything concrete that may upset crucial groups of voters or crucial interest groups. New policy initiatives, as I know only too well, having been finance minister, usually involve challenging a significant interest group with a vested interest in the status quo or committing to spending new money that somehow or other is going to connect with either increased taxes, increased debt, or reduced spending somewhere else in the budget. Now, politicians and media routinely collaborate in this process of deception on a daily basis. Neither generally deliberately set out to deceive. That's pro precisely why the wider impact generated by their behaviour is so significant. The media treat these meaningless announcements seriously because they've got to report something. And so by definition, there is a, a vested interest on both sides in pumping up something that is totally insignificant into an earth-shatteringly important announcement. The media, the commercial media, are businesses. They're engaged in manufacturing and retailing, entertainment and information. Accuracy and significance do not figure prominently in their business models. I know you'll be horrified to hear that, but sadly, it is the truth. In order to be electorally competitive, politicians need exposure. Nothing, literally nothing, is more important than name recognition. Anything which delivers publicity without upsetting a politically significant constituency is of huge value. That's why so much effort and energy is dedicated to in its pursuit. That's why leading politicians routinely appear in silly outfits, engage in juvenile stunts, make pointless announcements, tell personal stories, and of course, viciously attack their political opponents. If you want to get a run in the media, compare one of your opponents with Adolf Hitler or Colonel Gaddafi. That's why they do it. If they just give a kind of measured, considered, reasonable critique of an opponent, nobody will pay any attention. All of those things are in this mix. There's only one guaranteed way to fail in politics. There's only one guaranteed path to failure. That's anonymity. That is the only literally guaranteed way that you will not succeed in politics. So in effect, the battle of ideas has been supplanted by the battle of IDs. It's all about personality. It's all about the individual. It's all about getting exposure and the question of what you stand for, what you believe, what you propose, is marginal and disposable. It can be today the opposite of what it was yesterday, and nobody will care and very few will notice. 
The outcome of this endless charade takes me to the, the core point of tonight's lecture, which is the steady erosion of intellectual integrity in our national political discourse. Political leaders now are engaged in constructing pictures for voters that resemble mobile phone plans. They are designed to maximise outcomes for the producer and minimise and obscure the real choices that face the consumer. And this is not done in a completely cynical and deliberate way. It is something that has simply evolved and people respond rationally to signals, to points of punishment and reward, and collectively the behaviour that you see is an erosion of the integrity of our political discourse. Now this of course carries very, very serious implications for the standards of governance in Australia. Intellectual integrity in politics is, in my view, as important as ethical integrity. Democratic accountability is undermined by misinformation just as much by misappropriation, possibly even more so. The typical excesses of government, waste, cronyism, poor decision making, lack of transparency, pork barrelling, all of these things thrive when we have misinformed or uninformed voters. So the weaknesses in democracy that will always be there are very much influenced by the extent to which you have serious integrity in the public political debate. The fact that the misleading images created by our politicians and media generally don't involve outright lies, believe it or not, makes them more insidious because they are less obvious. Carefully selected pieces of information can be factually accurate but then easily pieced together in a particular configuration to create what I see as the political equivalence of optical illusions. So the impression that is created is very different from the reality, but when any individual component is challenged, the particular politician is able to fall back to this defence, this literal defence, well, this little bit here, no, no, that is actually true. It is easy by selective use of material to create highly misleading pictures, and that happens on a daily basis. Now, these techniques are also, of course, eroding the brands and the identities of the major political parties. And this was a key theme in the more recent book I put out called Politics with Purpose. The more the parties and leaders contort themselves to avoid controversial stances that may define them in the eyes of the electorate, the more they lose definition in the eyes of the electorate. All organisations, including political parties, have to have a defined purpose of some sort, some purpose that is reasonably clear to people in order to succeed. They have to have a mission. Sustained loss of purpose will ultimately destroy any organisation. The Australian Democrats, Democrats are now nearing extinction because the purpose which sustained them very successfully for an extended period of time, being something of a middle class umpire party to moderate the perceived excesses of the major parties, that sustained purpose has largely run its course. So the Democrats are a spent force. By collaborating in the media sideshow, the Liberal and Labor parties are now eating away at their own distinctive underlying purposes. The more these purposes are confused and obscured by short-term media games, the more voters lose ongoing attachment to those parties. The end result is that the extent to which people automatically vote and support, vote for and support one party has diminished dramatically in recent years. Much of the Greens' recent electoral success can be attributed to the relative clarity of their purpose. John Howard's extraordinary electoral resist, uh, resilience had a lot to do with strong product definition. The phrase, at least you know where you stand, was always there underneath the very, very resilient support for Howard. If we think for a moment of Labor's positions over 10, 15 years on things like climate change, asylum seekers, now more recently livestock exports, or on the other side, the Liberals' position on foreign ownership, coal seam gas, or industrial relations. You can see that the loss of definition, the loss of clear purpose, 
is very obvious. Now, clarity of choice is essential in democratic politics. Don't take any notice of people who tell you, why can't they just all get together and reach agreement? Why can't everybody just sit around on a table and sort it all out like good, reasonable people? Political parties represent different interests and different ideals. The contest between them and between those interests and between those ideals generates meaningful political choices, which enable democracy to function, because voters then are able to exercise at least some influence over government and the governance of their country because they are exercising their votes in the context of political choices. What happens if you get those parties all reaching agreement is that ultimately democracy is eroded because voters lose choice. They lose the capacity to say, well, I'll opt for this option because they stand for these things. I want to take the country in this direction. And it means the following things for me. And the other lot have got a very different set of propositions. So that choice and informed choice, reasonably informed choice, is fundamental to a functioning democracy. And when it blurs to the point of indistinction, democracy starts to lose its meaning. When our political discourse is dominated by such fundamentally important things as Tony Abbott's Speedos or Julia Gillard's shoes, then what you are seeing is democracy eroding, losing its content, and voters being denied the opportunity to make a genuinely informed choice. Now, the sorry state of our public discourse is not the fault of specific individuals or organisations. All of this supremacy of announceables and sound bites and pick facts reflect a wider set of structural shifts in our society. I entered Parliament in 1993 at the height of what I now in retrospect see as the age of rationalism. I left in 2010 at the peak of what I think can now be accurately described as the age of populism. I actually wrote a paper back in 1997 called Populism and Rationalism. Little did I know how pertinent that juxtaposition would prove to be. Over my time in Parliament, I lived through the shift in the tone and the content of public debate that's obvious in these two categories. From the mid-1980s to the late 1990s, national politics was dominated by big debates about big ideas. Since that time, shallow populism has almost completely taken over. After a decade or so of more or less reasonably serious political debate, our politics has been swamped by a tidal wave of trivia, stunts and posturing. I see that transition from rationalism to populism having occurred roughly between about 1998 and 2001, reflecting key points like the emergence of One Nation, the shock defeat of the Kennett government in 1999, the Tampa affair and to some degree the September the 11th attacks. All of those were critical punctuations in that transition. After years of relatively serious debate and relatively tough decisions from both sides of politics, a populist revolt from predominantly those most resistant to change ultimately transformed our politics. And both major parties switched their focus. They in particular absorbed the lessons of the defeat of the archpriest, the high priest of the age of rationalism, Jeff Kennett in Victoria in 1999. I think that we can now roughly divide the Australian population into five political tendencies. Now this is endlessly debatable. These groups overlap and you can talk about this till the cows come home and not reach agreement. But I think as a way of sensing how the population actually looks as opposed to the political party tags, I think this is useful. And these five groups are conservative, liberal in the small L sense, populist, laborist, if you apologize, uh, I apologize for creating what I think might be a new word, uh, and green. So that I think broadly the, the rough tendencies in the population, the underlying political DNA can broadly be defined in those five groups. Now, they may be fuzzy, they may be overlapping, there are certainly individuals who you could put in either category, there are probably some who could belong in three or four of them. Nonetheless, I think they're a useful way to look at the totality of our voting population. In the Hawke-Keating era, 
The terrain of battle was predominantly with the Liberals, the small L Liberals. So the political contest was largely fought out in that terrain. Since that time, the zone of battle has largely moved to the populist part of the spectrum. So the most engaged and in many cases the more educated voters who were central to the political contest 20, 25 years ago have in effect been supplanted. They have been pushed aside. The growing backlash against the reforms and the changes, not just by politicians but by life in that rationalist period and the associated erosion of tribal political loyalties has forced politicians to change focus. And what we have seen from the mid-90s on is a number of key themes in the political discourse that really reflect that, from John Howard's focus on battlers in 1995 to One Nation, of course, through to Bob Catter, Barnaby Joyce, and so forth. What that means is that more and more the battle of Australian politics has shifted focus to the battle for the most disengaged, the least interested, uh, people who have not been paying much attention, who uh, in many cases feel resentful at where the world is heading and where their politicians are taking them. So in simplistic shorthand terms, the Australian Democrats are no longer the pivotal point, as they were, they've been supplanted by a different kind of pivotal point. Believe it or not, I think the next federal election will probably be decided by Bob Catter. Um, that may worry some of you, it does worry me. But he and his constituency, that constituency, are now the, the central focus of the political contest, whereas it was the kind of Australian Democrats constituency in the 80s that was the focus. And again, simplistically, you could say that we are now fighting of the audience of today tonight, when in the past we were fighting of the audience of the 7.30 report. Now obviously things are more, much more complex than this. The economic impact of the mining boom, uh, prolonged economic growth, structural changes in our media, there's a whole host of factors that are in play over this extended period in shaping Australian politics. The net result though, I think is really important. That is we now have a political class almost entirely drawn from the educated elite, people like me, exercising most of their energies trying to communicate with the most disengaged members of the community, where level of education is becoming almost as important a political indicator as income level, and it's possibly now more important. And because our political leaders, by and large, haven't emerged from the ranks of the disengaged, they don't understand those people all that well, and they tend to exaggerate the perceived significance of their distinctive characteristics. So when we see an almost exclusively university educated political leadership endlessly professing sympathy with tradies, everybody outside the political class is able to see right through it. But to people in the political class, that's just what you do. That's the smart thing to do. Now this extended period of empty populism has had profoundly negative impacts on Labor because as announceables have supplanted policies, personalities have trumped programs, the clarity of Labor's mission has inevitably faded. Yes, identifiably Labor initiatives are still launched, but usually in response to immediate political pressures rather than any strong sense of inner purpose. These symptoms, I believe, all reflect wider underlying structural economic shifts, whether it's the politics as entertainment, the triumph of populism, Labor's loss of purpose, they all reflect the sweeping structural economic and technological changes that are sweeping through Western societies. Because we're living through it, I think we underestimate the importance of the transformation that is occurring all around us, driven by digital technologies and the associated phenomenon of globalisation. The countless incremental shifts in human behaviour that are associated with and being unlocked by computers, mobile phones, the internet, iPods, iPads and all the other devices are producing a structural upheaval in human existence that I think will in retrospect be seen as more important, more profound 
than the Industrial Revolution. In his landmark book, Fault Lines, and in a more recent article in Foreign Affairs, former IMF chief economist Raghuram Rajan, who is now the chief economic advisor to the Indian Prime Minister, shows how structural economic change in developed nations incubated the global financial crisis. Rapid technological change and globalisation has undermined the market value of labour in much of the workforces in developed nations. Faced with an obvious challenge, the threat to living standards, the prospect of market forces significantly eroding the living standards of large sections of their electorates, politicians across the developed world opted to paper over the gap with debt, public and private. That inevitably proved unsustainable and the finances of major Western nations blew up and we are now living through the consequences. That's broadly the Rajan thesis and I agree with it. I think it is the best way of understanding the deep origins of the global financial crisis. Within little more than a generation, Western economies have moved from a world where only a minority of workers required specialised skills into one where most workers require serious skills. And more and more, they need to be adaptable, flexible, and have a variety of capabilities that can move with technological change and possess what are called soft skills as well. There's been a fundamental transformation that is still on foot in the production process that is having profound effects. We're accustomed to seeing our economy as an artefact of three factors, land, labour and capital. I think we now should make that four, land, labour, capital and human capital. Because I think the idea that the specialised skills and the, the dominant inputs in the production process we now have uh, that should be grouped with a broader concept that is ultimately just talking about brute force is risible. We really need to distinguish between these things. Muscle will always be important in the production process, but now more than ever, the organ that governs muscle, the brain, is the dominant human input into the production process. Now the production process, its inputs, how it operated, and most particularly the distribution of its rewards, continue to dominate human society, and I think it's reasonably safe to assume we'll always do so to a degree. When it changes, our society changes. That is precisely what we're living through. And these changes don't just affect economic relationships. They challenge, challenge entrenched identity. We can obviously respond by the economic disruptions of these, to the economic disruptions of these changes by engaging in what has been described as the endless race between technology and education. Different Western societies have made better or worse efforts to do this. Nobody is particularly outstanding. That doesn't help us deal, though, with the impact that economic change has on identity. We are all, as human beings, in varying degrees, obsessed with status. Have a look at how people fight over who sits where in federal parliament, and you'll see what I mean. And I'm sure that we can all come up with all kinds of examples. Academia, of course, is not short of status squabbles. We are all obsessed with status. And if your contribution to society is being devalued by technological change and economic change, the consequences are much broader than merely financial. Your identity, your sense of self-worth is being assaulted. And that's, of course, ultimately why populism is on the rise all around the developed world, because populism is a, a direct appeal to identity and to essentially backward-looking identity. As George Lakoff memorably said in his very interesting book, Don't Think of an Elephant, people don't vote their self-interest, they vote their identity. There's a lot of studies that show that the link between self-interest and voting is very vague and often very hard to identify. But the link between identity, who I am, do you understand me, do you represent me, do you feel what I feel, do you see the world as I feel, as I see it, that is a very powerful driver of voter behaviour. And if you want to see an excellent study of the nexus between these factors, of economic disruption, dislocation, loss of opportunity, loss of status, and the consequences, read Susan Faludi's book, Stift, which is an excellent description uh, in detail of a range of communities in the United States and the impact on 
the, the whole psychology of these people and how they see the world and themselves when they are dislocated by economic and technological change. Now, I believe the current bewildering confusion in our political discourse is directly related to these economic factors. Our legacy institutions and our political parties are creatures of the industrial age, woven around a particular kind of economy and society. Now, that world is receding. It's not going to disappear, it's receding. The Industrial Revolution didn't cause agriculture to disappear, but it just changed dramatically the total picture of society and agriculture's role in it. Our society will continue to change shape, and old debates, old processes, old ideas, old mentalities are seeding ground to the new. Ancient institutions like universities are being forced to move to different modes of delivery, to digital modes of delivery. Or if they don't, they will simply melt into insignificance. Entrenched debates that are really relics of the industrial age, like the prolonged arm wrestle in our health system between public and private, and distributional squabbles that still dominate our thinking and our politics, are going to have to give way to the new challenges of efficient resource utilisation and well-being management, the issues of contemporary society, not the arm wrestle of the 1970s. All industrial societies, pretty much, Ireland is a bit of an outlier, but it's debatable as to whether you'd call it an industrial society. All industrial societies have developed political systems built around a bipolarity between fairness and enterprise. All of them have had a party that you could describe as the party of fairness, in our case, Labor, and a party of enterprise, in our case, the Liberals. And these parties have fought an endless struggle over the distribution of the rewards of the production process and of national economic endeavour generally. Now, this polarity no longer dominates the affairs of our nation in anything like the way that it did 30 or 40 years ago. New fault lines driven by globalisation, environmental sustainability, technology are emerging, bringing forth new issues, issues that do not fit with that old frame. That old frame is Labor's natural comfort zone. Fighting against work choices, increasing pensions, introducing paid maternity leave, all of these things are straightforward propositions for Labor. That's what we do, what we've been doing for 100 years in different guises, 120 years or whatever. Climate change, asylum seekers, animal welfare, and I could add others, these do not fit. They do not fit a workers versus bosses, uh, lower income earners versus high income earners, battle over the rewards of the production process frame. And it's not a coincidence that Labor has been all at sea on those kind of issues because they do not fit the underlying DNA. And the Liberals have been little better. More and more, that old polarity is being superseded by new polarities and ones that it's very hard for the established parties to navigate. The age of populism is going to pass, just as the age of rationalism passed. I obviously can't predict when or how, maybe sooner than we think. Pauline Hanson demonstrated how easy it is for a single previously anonymous individual to have a huge political impact in this country if the underlying conditions are favourable. One insistent voice can express the deep frustration of millions. Now, I don't know if there is a counterpart, a modern version of Pauline Hanson out there, but I do know that conditions in our political marketplace are absolutely ripe for a revolt of the engaged absolutely ripe. Mounting anger right across the, the erstwhile spectrum, Labor and Liberal, with our childish political discourse, is going to find an outlet at some point. Now, there are no simple interventions that will solve this problem. People's minds immediately leap to things like, how about if we made this change to our political structure, to our rules, get rid of the states, do this, do that, do the other, some with more merit than others. We need to beware of the simplistic siren song of political reform. There are good reasons why ostensibly well-intentioned propositions like secret ballots in Parliament haven't been introduced. They're not good ideas. 
and fiddling with rules is really not much of a response to the effects of elemental structural change. The issue is indeed much wider than parliamentary politics. Crucial non-government institutions like universities, the ACTU, the business world, have hardly covered themselves in glory in the wider public policy debate in the past decade or two either. They aren't exactly out there generating huge ground vacant public policy ideas and so we have a malaise that is not just about parliamentary politics. We all know that consumer behaviour broadly governs the fortunes of businesses. Voter behaviour ultimately shapes our politics. And voter behaviour consists of a great deal more than just voting. Other than a relatively small minority of partisans or people who've got a bee in their bonnet, most people who you would describe as politically engaged, in other words, who follow what's going on to some degree, uh, have some interest, have opinions, try to stay in touch with things and talk to others about what's going on, most people who fit that definition are still nonetheless essentially passive, content to express their frustrations to those around them and not really do very much about it. Believe it or not, it's actually surprisingly easy to influence the direction of politics in this country. Yet there are countless Australians who have the interest and the knowledge that would enable them to do so, who choose, in effect, to remain inert. Now, sometimes this reflects understandable reservations about how they'll be perceived in their workplace, their family, their neighbourhood. The most important thing that opinion leaders in this country can do to tackle this problem that I believe is, is on the minds of a lot of people in this country is to encourage those who are ultimately accountable to them to be active, to participate. Every time I meet someone who says, I'm interested in politics, uh, you know, what should I do? I always say, I do not care if you are going to go off and become a Liberal Party member. If that's the orientation of your values, your beliefs, your views, that is fine. The key thing is do something. Get involved. Throw your weight around. Use what knowledge and expertise you've got to try and influence things. You'll be surprised at the effect that you can have, particularly if you are persistent and particularly if you are prepared to roll with the punches a bit. So if those in our community who use their leadership positions in companies, in organisations, to send messages to those who report to them. If you are active, expressing opinions, involved in things, as long as it is not a deliberate attempt to undermine the interests of our organisation, we will approve. We encourage that. We are moving from a world into a world where Twitter and Facebook are the new dinner party and barbecue. So one way or another, the old world where people just sort of natter away amongst their peers and not do anything is kind of disappearing anyway. The most valuable contribution that we can all make is to use our power in the political marketplace to try and change what I think a lot of people see as a very ordinary state of play in our politics. The power that a demand for high quality politics will unleash if it is activated, I think will be an irresistible force. To me, whatever the outcome on issues, on who wins elections and who doesn't, on who is on the TV news, ultimately that is a secondary consideration. I find myself in the position of lamenting the fact that I started my career in student politics and that's where I ended up. And that's roughly what it's become. You are now seeing the nation's politics more and more resemble student politics, where the content of what is in play is largely irrelevant. That is terrible for Australia, terrible for democracy, terrible for our future, but ultimately there is no magic solution. It's in our hands, in our communities, in our workplaces, in the environment we all inhabit as potential or actual opinion leaders to do something about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lindsay, for a very thought-provoking and hard-hitting um, speech. Uh, I think and hope that there are lots of questions in the audience. So who would like to start the questioning? Yes. Uh, Graham Holes was my name. Lindsay, if uh, Kevin Rudd had done his numbers right and ended up with you as treasurer instead of Wayne Swan, uh, 
would you still be in politics and would he still be leader? Mm. <laughs> Inter- interesting question. Uh, look, I, Im- impossible to answer because you never know how the world unfolds if you sort of turn the clock back and change the, the settings. Uh, but believe it or not, my reason for leaving was genuine. Uh, you know, two sets of kids, there were, I've got two younger kids who at that stage were six and four, two older kids, teenagers by previous marriage. I was in politics for 18 years. You get to a point where the stresses on those relationships, uh, the broader family relationship, the relationship with my wife, pay uh, a big price. And you've ultimately got to make some serious choices. So uh, I tend to think that those people who snigger and sneer at politicians who stand up and say they're leaving to spend more time with their family are typically people who sleep in their own bed every night and work nine to five. Uh, and do not understand what it is like. So the answer is I don't really know, uh, but I suspect probably it wouldn't have made any difference. As to Kevin's fortunes, again, who knows? I think uh, the, the thing that really brought Kevin undone, and I'm on the public record of saying I think what was done was wrong, the government needed a reset, not an execution, uh, but it got an execution. Uh, I think the thing that ultimately was problematic for Kevin was that uh, and something I learned, or I didn't really understand, is that one of the quirks of our system is if you're in opposition for a long time, you develop a set of habits and mentalities that are possibly appropriate for opposition, totally inappropriate for government, and it takes you quite a while to unlearn them, quite a while to get out of them. It took John Howard about 18 months before he started sort of running his government vaguely coherently, for example, in 1996, 97. And the great tragedy for Kevin Rudd was that just about the time when natural forces would have produced that, the GFC came along and sort of injected this huge dose of sort of manic kind of energy and activity and media intensity and whatever, and it exacerbated the things that I think ultimately were problematic for him. Uh, Mr Tanner, Eric Platt, um, two questions if I could. Firstly, the media comment about GST changing. Can you give a, um, a finance minister perspective on that? and the media comment too. And the situation in New South Wales with the coal licences fraud that's being unravelled. Thank you. Um, On the GST, the the, the critical issue in play when the Labor opposition opposed it back in the late 90s, which tended to be obscured partly by the sort of stuff I've talked about, was the distributional impact of the tax mix on the socioeconomic spectrum. In effect, what was happening back in the late 90s was a government coming along and saying, we are going to reconfigure the tax system so that lower income earners pay more and higher income earners pay less. That was literally what was in play. In fact, Tim Fisher, memorably, when he was challenged about this, responded by saying, but we're not communists. That was his explanation for that. Uh, So that was at the core of Labor's opposition to it. It's at the core of Labor's reluctance to increase the reliance on the GST. So in a sense, that's a good example of the, that old polarity still in play. And I don't downplay the significance of that polarity. It's still there and it's still pretty important in our society. It's just that it used to dominate almost everything, but it's now being elbowed aside more and more by the things. But it's still there and it's still very significant as that's an example. Look, I don't know enough about the uh, things that are going on in New South Wales to really have a strong view. Uh, I know some of the players quite well, but I've never had any dealings with any of them as far as I can recall that are even remotely connected with any of those events. So, in effect, my knowledge is no greater than what you would have from following the media. Uh, You have to be careful not to prejudge these things, uh, but certainly it's of great concern. uh, And, uh, you know, you, you see these things in politics from time to time, uh, varying degrees of seriousness and concern. Uh, there's been a particular problem in New South Wales for a while, obviously, but Victoria hasn't been immune. No state's been immune. They are of great concern. They do significant political damage. You will never completely eliminate them. Uh, it's also particularly a problem at state level because that's where you tend to have the decision making that is most directly relevant to commercial interests. So the opportunities are greater at state level. Yes, I find it distressing, but I withhold judgment on uh, 
any wrongdoing while these things are still being, uh, still being teased out. Georgina Fitzpatrick, um, my question is in the context of the dumbing down of politics and the collusion of politicians to some extent in this, and concerns question time. I was an education officer in Parliament House for two periods, in 1992, where it was more civilised, and in 2000 to 2002, which had, it had deteriorated markedly. Pretty and bad, I was then. so ashamed taking school groups there, because they were learning that all you do is shout at each other and total incivility, and nothing was actually found out. No accountability, really, which is the, presumably the purpose of question time. So have you any solution to that? Um, I used to say to people, I, I had a semi-serious solution, which if you think about it, possibly might have helped. It sounds silly. Get rid of people speaking, standing up. So you are, when you speak, you are sitting down. It is a lot harder to carry on like a maniac uh, and wave your arms and go red in the face and sort of spit all over people and whatever when you are sitting down, believe me. Um, now, as I said, this was not... People didn't treat this suggestion seriously, so I didn't pursue it. Uh, and I mention it really tongue-in-cheek today. Um, there's a... I have complex views on question time. It, it is a joke. It is a complete joke. And really what it now is, is simply an audition for the 6 o'clock news. So what you've got is a range of people including some backbenchers and you know, shadow ministers, ministers, whatever, who are all there fighting a battle to get themselves and their message and preferably their in incredible claviness and wittiness onto the commercial TV news. And that's all it is. So that governs how it happens. It, is, it has got a kind of mob mentality underneath on both sides, which makes it very hard for even mild-mannered people like me not to you know, get in there and throw punches because it, there is a sort of collective context which is very hard to stay separate from. It does still have, I think, one implicit value which you would want to be absolutely clear that you didn't get rid of, and that is that if you are a minister who has done something wrong and uh, something culpable and that starts to trickle out, then you live in fear of question time. Because for all of the posturing and yelling and screaming, there is no more challenging thing than to be standing up at that microphone with people literally all around you, up in the galleries, behind you, in front of you, and the people in front of you baying for blood and you are under pressure. So that, albeit somewhat gladiatorial method of accountability, should not be easily dispensed with. It's one of the uh, differences between our politics and the US, where there is no equivalent. To me, that bit that's underneath it actually matters a lot. I've seen a lot of ministers over the years under pressure. I've seen ministers forced to resign. Uh, I've been involved in uh, attacking ministers and whatever. I've been involved, thankfully not in any major way, on the defensive side. Uh, that accountability mechanism still matters a lot. The threat of it helps to concentrate the minds of people who are exercising considerable power and authority on your behalf and to keep them to some degree in check. I've come to think of politics as being the position where the tectonic plates of society with spoken and unspoken issues collide. And I think thought there was one perhaps significant element that you didn't talk about tonight, although I suppose it's an undercurrent for each of the, uh, the points about your analysis of society. And you haven't talked about the gender issue, because it's, it is extremely interesting to note that, for example, in the United States, uh, Obama won in part because there was a significant difference between the way in which the female vote was going and that the distinction there between between communitarian and individual, uh, and whereas the, the, uh, the Republicans obviously had the kind of country club view of the world uh, put out. But it's also striking here that, uh, uh, that uh, the Labor Party and the Liberals, there's now a striking discrepancy, an increasing discrepancy about the way in which women are inclined to vote. But that also, obviously, cuts across 
the traditional values of many of, of what were called the Howard Battlers. But I wondered whether you'd comment on that. Well, I, I think in some respects the reason I didn't really venture into that terrain, Barry, is it warrants its own lecture in its own right. I think there is an array of very interesting and challenging questions there which, uh, you know, t for me to sort of fit in, I'd be, you know, I'd almost be starting a, an entirely separate and very substantial uh, sort of exploration. Uh, the, I, th I think probably the, one of the significant things which you, you would remember well is that Labor historically had a significant gender deficit and I think the underlying reason was that it was predominantly a party of male trade unionists. And so the Labor Party's origins came really from the workplace, from a male-dominated workplace and male-dominated unions, and to some extent it is still influenced by that. But of course what we have seen subsequently is the transformation of the workplace, transformation of unions. Uh, it is now common to have female leaders of the union movement and unions, for example, whereas 30 years ago that was very unusual. Uh, so I think there have been some underlying structural things that have changed Labor as well. Uh, there's a, a, a sort of complex, uh, and, and there's been quite a bit of stuff written about this, both the US and a, and a bit in Australia, there's, there's a sort of complex set of things here which people theorise about, like you, you've heard of, no doubt, the, uh, the, the mummy party and the daddy party thesis, that the the conservatives are the, the, the sort of equivalent of the traditional father in the family that tells you you're not allowed to do things and punishes you and runs everything. And the, the Labor Party and its equivalents are the mummy party who looks after people and helps them and stuff like this. Now, whatever you think of those theses, there are a lot of kind of serious explorations of these things going on. Uh, the, the US, of course, has got the additional complication of uh, the um, ethnic overlays. So merely, uh, merely by having a, um, uh, a sort of Hispanic and African-American kind of overlay that doesn't have quite the same gender imbalance, that uh, also complicates the picture. And I think also that the, um, what the Republicans have allowed themselves uh, is to be driven by the the resentments of predominantly male uh, workers. And so they have harvested and tried to build on what are predominantly male resentments. So you can kind of look at these questions from either angle. You look at it through a sort of male lens or a female lens. Very, very complicated question. Uh, and uh, we need to be wary of kind of uh, simplistic analyses because almost by definition, uh, although there are obvious differences between men and women, there are also infinite differences within each group as well in their perspectives on things and how they view things. My name's Kelvin. I'm a regular viewer of Q&A and Late Line. Um, getting a bit irritated with Tony Jones continually interrupting people who are trying to answer their question and occasionally comes up against someone who raises their voice and out voices him. Um, What's the best way to handle the rudeness of Tony Jones when he's sort of going overboard? Um, look, I'm, I'm probably the last, the, the wrong person to ask that question uh, because I, I used to actually, and, and this is not about Tony, I, I have no axe to grind with, with Tony and I think, I think different people have different tastes for these kind of shows, you know, so um, uh, you, you do get a variety of opinions on that, you know, and I've heard people express those kind of views a bit and so it, it's understandable, but you also get different views. So partly there's a kind of viewer taste question there, but my own view was that I preferred to be interviewed by people who were trying to kill me. Um, my favourite interviewer of all time was the late, great Paul Lynham, whose opening question would usually be some variation of, you haven't stopped beating your wife, have you, Mr Tanner? You know, that kind of totally loaded, you know, no way to answer, sort of aggressive, go for the throat kind of question. Now, I liked being interviewed by that, like that, because that enabled me to fire up and to be a little bit passionate, a little bit expressive, and it also put me to the test. And if there were weaknesses in what I was saying, then I was reasonably confident that the interviewer would find them. John Fain can be a bit like that from time to time. He waxes and wanes, but, you know, um, but, but 
John, I don't mind John trying to, you know, go for the weaknesses and so on because that's how you sort out the sheep from the goats. Um, I had an interview after my recent book came out with Lee Sales that became something of a sort of public discussion matter about her aggressive demeanour or whatever, and I kind of went, well, you know, I didn't think it was that great, but I don't care because, you know, it was fine by me. Um, my worst ever interview experience was a person who shall remain nameless on, I think, Sunday evening ABC radio years ago, whose opening question was, um, uh, Mr Tanner, you've recently put out a book, some very interesting observations about the economic structure of Australian society. Can you elaborate? <laughs> and I could feel myself going to sleep, let alone anybody <laughs> listening. You know, so so that's, the, that's the problem. So to cut some slack to the interviewers, and, and this is why the stuff I carry on about, about the theatre stuff, is nuanced. You actually want a bit of theatre. You know, that if you make it incredibly worthy and earnest and boring, you effectively exclude almost everybody. So a bit of theatre, a bit of biffo, all that kind of stuff, the journalist not letting you get off the hook um, does have a role. It becomes a, a bit of a matter of opinion as to how far it should go. Uh, I think one question that is always worth asking, not specifically about Tony Jones, but all interviewers, is are they even-handed? in how they go about it. So is their demeanour and the extent to which they put pressure and unsettle their target, does that, is that pretty much the same across the political spectrum? That's when you, I think, that's when there are some who have some questions to answer, is that they can be much tougher on one side than the other without even realising it. I'll uh, reluctantly bring this question time to a close because I know there's plenty of you out there uh, still wanting to uh, say something. Uh, but can I ask Jim Carlton to come up and uh, thank the speaker? Well, thank you very much, Cheryl and Lindsay and Tim. Why would uh, I be asked by Chairman Chair of the Accountability Roundtable as a former Liberal politician to get up and say some nice things about Lindsay Tanner. <laughs> now, I actually live in the electorate of Melbourne, although I used to have a, an electorate in Sydney. And I can honestly say that um, he's the best local member I've had since I represented myself in McKellar. <laughs> and that's the sort of thing my friend Gough Whitlam used to say. <laughs> um, the other thing I liked about his lecture was that I actually liked the idea of people sitting down to ask questions. Oh, very good. Um, those sort of things can work. I worked uh, in England for a few years in manufacturing industry for a wonderful company run by an Australian-born Greek. And in the very, very stratified society of Great Britain, he overcame the class structure by requiring everybody to be addressed by their first name. And it was remarkably successful. And Barry Jones, all you have to do is read my paper of about 20 years ago for doubling the size of federal electorates and having a male and a female member. And everybody having two votes, one for a woman, one for a man. And you'd have an equality of members. And I think it's still a very good suggestion. It's still seen and revered in political science departments, but it didn't get a very good reception when I put it up <laughs> in Parliament. And in fact, in fact, none of the males would even mention it to me. <laughs> and, and the female senators on my side hated it. I got there on merit. Well, I do admire uh, Lindsay uh, because in politics you have to understand, I believe, that the electorate does not vote in its medium to long-term interest. It simply doesn't. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of the, the literature, as the political scientists say, which supports that. And in fact, I've got some learned documents in that. That's one of the reasons why, in France, they haven't had a balanced budget for 37 years, and 57% of the country's product goes through the government. Because every year, people have been offered something that they'd like to have now. And it means that France, if you read the current uh, edition of The Economist, is an appalling mess. Now, Australia's not in that sort of mess, and one of the reasons was uh, mentioned by uh, Lindsay, and that was the period, really, of the Hawke-Keating reform period. Now, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that I was one of the Liberal dries 
that fought with the populists within our own side to support what Hawke and Keating did. Because about 70% of the population opposed every one of their economic measures. It's a very, very scary thought. And when you talk about leadership, the business community says, why don't you show leadership? Well, I worked on the fight back uh, uh, policy with Hewson, which was the longest suicide note ever written in political history. <laughs> and that was, that was policy at its finest. And essentially, it was hardly any different from what Hawke and Keating managed to get through with the support of about half our side. And the other side wanted to vote with the Democrats because 70% of the population didn't want it. Now, here's a man who understands that equation. I think tonight he's given a very serious set of examples as to why that kind of thing is important and why we're going through one of those awful periods. Now, I'm a bit of a political tragic as far as American politics is concerned. And America goes through tremendous waves of horrible bits and good bits. They killed 600,000 of each other in the Civil War. And that was a really bad bit. Contrast that with what they did immediately after the Second World War with the Brereton Woods Agreements, with the Marshall Plan, with the United Nations. America is going through one of those terrible periods now and one hopes it'll come out again. We went through a wonderful period of reform back in the mid 80s. We're going through a very bad period now, but if people like Lindsay have any say in it, then we've got a good chance of going through a good period in the future. And that's why I admire this man. Uh, he's an intellect, intellectual in politics, but also a practical intellectual. And he's always stood for what he believed. But importantly too, uh, he gets to the intellectual heart of what the real issues are. And he promotes it uh, to the public uh, with his well-written books. So. Uh, on behalf of the Australian uh, the, uh, Accountability Roundtable, which I'm proud to be associated with because I have a deep interest in integrity in politics, um, thank you, Lindsay, for agreeing to speak to us tonight and thank you for adding substantially to the intellectual side of the political debate. Oh, and <laughs> now, now, it's always part of my contract when somebody's left politics and don't have to declare a gift to actually give him one. <laughs> now he's got to find it. <laughs> Thank, you Thank you very much. Thank you very much.